Hi, my name is Catherine Van Nuys. I graduated from Columbia College in 2005. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today and to introduce Khadija Sharif Drinkard. She's Senior Vice President of Business and Legal Affairs at Viacom Media Networks, where she's responsible for the oversight of business and legal affairs for original programming, music programming, specials, and news. Khadija has a fascinating background, having begun her career as a political activist in the eighth grade while growing up in Harlem. She went on to earn her bachelor's degree in political science from Columbia University and her Juris Doctor from Fordham University. The Black Girls Rock franchise to BET and closed the deal for the biopic, The New Edition Story, which was BET's highest rated show ever. She holds several leadership positions, including with Viacom's mentoring program, Get Connected, and as president of the board of directors of the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association. In 2013, she was presented the National Association of Multi-Ethnicity and Communications Luminary Award and the National Association of Female Executives Award on behalf of Viacom. She contributes to the field of philanthropy and human development and has been on delegations to South Africa, Rome, Russia, China, and the UK, and has worked with the UN to help aspiring businesswomen from Iraq. Now, Khadija is going to talk about how to be a trailblazer. We'd like to make this as interactive as possible, so there will be a couple of live polls during the presentation for you to participate, and plenty of time for Q&A at the end. You can submit your questions as you have them, and you should see the options at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to ask a question live, please select raise hand so I know to call on you. Otherwise, I can ask the question on your behalf. And now I'll let Khadija take it over. Thank you, Catherine. It's such a pleasure to be here. So let's jump right in. I, Catherine gave a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much. I feel a little bit embarrassed, but I appreciate it. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about my career path, if you will. Um, I started out as an intern at Viacom many years ago. Actually, I was just finished my first year at Columbia and had joined the development department as an intern where I was reading scripts and taking pitches and basically learning the ropes of the entertainment industry. I had started to do um, a number of jobs in that space and after my internship was over, I worked in various departments as when I went back to Viacom after college. I actually graduated from Columbia then went into the talent department at Viacom and worked in various departments thereafter, including development and production, um, business and legal affairs, as well as the talent group. I worked also for various divisions within Viacom. Through, over my career, I worked at Nickelodeon, Nick at Night, TV Land, Nick Jr., and helped to even launch Spike TV before I got to BET. One of the key things that I learned in my career was it was important to raise my hand for assignments that were not just within my comfort zone, but things that were not in my comfort zone as well. So I raised my hand for some M&A deals for some theater productions. I went from kids and children's programming to adult programming. I worked in music programming and started a whole new career at BET in that area. Um, but I also participated in some leadership programs and that was everything from mentoring, starting a mentoring program that went company-wide to helping women develop an employee resource group for women who were middle managers and wanted to get ahead in their career. And so it was really important that I focused on not just my job as the lawyer, but also helping to build my own brand as a person who cared about the company. So brand establishment was really important to me from the outset. Um, one of the things that I think is important is that, that we're known for not just what we do in our jobs as attorneys, but that we're also known for who we are as people. So we always say this, this special thing at work. We say we want to bring our whole selves to work. And so I focused on that a lot. I was really passionate about women's issues. I was passionate about education and still am, mentoring and helping people get ahead. And so I really focused on, in addition to building my own brand, bringing people along with me. I wanted to build a talent pipeline. I wanted to ensure that people who were being developed by me had a chance to take on leadership positions within my company and also had a chance to their whole selves to work as well. So I focused in those areas in my career. And then finally, you know, in this space, I wanted to layer leadership. I wanted to make sure that everybody who I could develop, and who I could touch and inspire 
had a chance to feel empowered in their own jobs and that they could bring their entire thoughts and ideas to the process and that they could change ideas that were status quo, if you will, and make something new, create something more amazing so that we could do better in our own jobs. So the one thing I also learned, I will say, as I was developing leadership in my team, was that it's really important to give people credit. People typically, um, you know, they work really hard. They, I realized that they actually enjoy giving and learning and developing other people as well. And so I wanted to make sure I gave them credit. So, in, so just some takeaways from my own career path and some of the things that were important to me was that in the process of building my own brand and developing my own professional network, I was also building other people to come along with me. So let's talk a little bit now about risk taking. And because, you know, one of the key things that I would say is that as I was developing myself, I realized that taking risks was a really big part of what I needed to do in order to be successful. Um, I want to start off with the definition of a risk. I looked up this definition and I thought, boy, if all of us saw this definition, we probably would be risk adverse, most of us. And probably many of us are because of the way that we define a risk in itself. And it's the, it basically reads the exposure um, to the chance of injury or loss. So I thought to myself, yikes, you know, it's not exactly calling us all to jump in and to do something brave and different. So I want to reframe it for us. I want to reframe the definition to something that would read more like exposure to an opportunity to gain or accomplish something great. And if we could all think of it that way, perhaps we would be more willing and adept at taking more risk. So let me talk a little bit about the two types of risk, the way I see them. You can have small risk and you can have big risk, right? We have two buckets here. Let's think about the risk profile that each of us might have. Some of us might be really good at taking small risks, things that don't really sort of have a large impact on how our lives are going to all be altered possibly in the future. And then there are other risks sometimes that may have a more long-lasting impact or an extended impact on our own lives. So I think that oftentimes many of us don't take risks because of that four-letter word that begins with an F, and it is fear. Fear stops us from moving forward oftentimes. And unfortunately, because of fear, we stop learning how to do things that naturally, you know, we're supposed to be challenging ourselves with as humans. When you think about children as young people, they actually take all kinds of risks. The first time you actually get up to stand and walk as a child, that's a risk. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but those children are standing up on those two legs and moving forward. So we have to be the same way. We have to figure out how we're going to move forward, even though we might be afraid a little bit, or even though we have fear that actually, to some extent, might even paralyze us. So I want to do something. I want to take this moment to ask, um, you know, a couple of questions and to introduce two polls. And Catherine's going to help us with that. So despite your, your fear, let's talk about how we can move forward. So Catherine, let's launch the first poll. Okay, so the first poll actually is, and she, you'll see the question on the screen, but I want to just present it so that you have a scenario in mind. So the question is, how many of you would sit in an open chair at the conference room table full of senior executives as opposed to sitting in a seat on the back row of chairs, right? In this situation, the senior executives in the room who are attending the meeting have already taken their seats. So the, the seat that is open and is unoccupied is next to the CEO. Would you occupy the seat or would you leave it for another peer to take? Please launch your answers now. It looks like almost 90% of our participants would take the seat next to the CEO. Oh, that's excellent. Well, that sounds like we have a lot of brave people. Fantastic. Okay, well, let's go to the second question. The second question is, we'll launch the second poll. I'm actually curious too about the 12% of the, the people, who, people who said they would not, but <laughs> okay. The second question is, in a company-wide staff meeting, the president of the company asks if anyone has something to share. If you have been concerned about a particular issue that is sensitive but not confidential for quite some, for quite some time, and you're not sure whether or not you should give feedback at this particular time, would you or would you not raise your issue in a company-wide staff meeting answering the president's question at that point. 
we may now launch our answer. Looks like 75% would not ask a sensitive question. Okay, great. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, so let me just tell you, I'm gonna exit this. So let me tell you that both of those polls are actually a representation of what happened to me. Um, so let me give you some personal examples. So I call this my seat next to Philippe. I was in a, a C-suite meeting one day. I was actually invited to a C-suite meeting with the CEO of our company, former CEO at this point, but at that point he was our CEO. And um, I entered the room and noticed that everybody who was supposed to be there who was senior um, in terms of being in his um, senior staff meeting was already seated in their seats. There were people who were my peers who were seated along the window seal in the back row. And I noticed that there was a seat next to him that was open. And I thought, oh, well, it seems like I should take that seat. Um, it was a risk. It was a small risk, I would say, but I did take the seat. And I took the seat because I wanted them to know that I was happy to be invited to the meeting, but I was confident, I was present, and I was belonging there in my mind. I had belonged in that seat. I was ready to engage and I wanted them to know that I was gonna be a part of the meeting in a way that was going to be um, participatory and not just sitting on the backside of the window seal. So that was my first scenario. And it seems like almost 90% of you would have done the same thing. Okay, fantastic. So um, to the second scenario, the second question that I asked you about the staff meeting was actually a real situation that I had as well. And in that situation, I actually was in a staff meeting where the president of the company asked if we had any things that we wanted to share that could help the company move forward or anything that was on our mind. And so I raised my hand and I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do have something I want to share. Um, I had been volunteering at my junior high school in Harlem with a lot of young people who were African-American and Latino at the time. And I wanted to make sure that um, they felt that I was bringing some of the best work that I could as a person who worked at Nickelodeon at the same time, whether, you know, I would bring them toys and all kinds of stuff. And then I would say, do you watch the programming? And they would say, no. And I would say, why not? And they said, because we don't feel like we're represented on television. And so I raised my hand and I said, you know, a lot of children who look just like me don't watch the network because they don't feel like they see themselves on TV. And so it was Nickelodeon's diversity problem back in the 90s. And the head of pro programming actually, was really upset with me at the point and said, you shouldn't have said that in the staff meeting. And I said, well, why not? This is the place to bring issues, right? For us to challenge these, these ideas and to make the company better. And so it landed me in hot water, but I got a bigger job. So he said, well, since you're so concerned about it, your job now is to sit with me and take pitches. So we had to start looking for multicultural programming for Nickelodeon. Well, fast forward, it was great because we ended up getting shows like Dora the Explorer and Diego and other shows. And so what was my statement? My statement was, yeah, I care more about the company succeeding than I did about my own success at the moment. And as a result, something great came out of it. But I did take a risk. It was pretty scary. Um, I didn't think it was scary when I did it. I just thought that I needed to say something. And then finally, my other example, I would say about risk taking in my own personal life that I think has landed me in a better position, hopefully, <laughs> than if I didn't take this path was when I finished law school, most people take the law firm route. They go to a big firm or they clerk or they have a fellowship of some sort. And I decided that I was gonna do something different. Viacom had launched a program for management associates. Many of the people in the program were people from business school or from graduate school in the art space. And very few people were actually lawyers. And nobody who was a lawyer in the program previously had ever been placed inside of the company's business affairs department. So I decided I was going to do it despite being told by friends who had done it previously not to do it. I did it because I believed in changing the program that would benefit me in a way that I knew I could be successful. So typically, you would have to rotate different departments, let's say. And I said to myself, well, you know what? If I could tweak this just a bit and stay in the same department and have people come to me, I could build this into what I needed to be for myself. So my statement was, you know what, I think you guys have pretty good intentions about what you want me to do, but I think I know how to best navigate my career. And if I can orchestrate this a little bit differently, I can blaze my own trail in this space. Well, it paid off, thank goodness. And so I'm still there and running actually the department out for business affairs. 
So that just goes to show you that sometimes risks do pay off. Um, so when you take risks, I think the, the thing is to ask yourself some key questions, right? The first thing you have to ask yourself is, does the risk make sense for what you're trying to achieve? What is the end game? What's the goal? What are you trying to get out of this experience? Risks are not just meant to be taken just for the sake of taking a risk. That, that, now that's not exactly the smartest thing to do, but are you willing also to live with the outcome or the results of whatever risk you decide to take? I think that's also something you should ask yourself. Um, if you decide to move forward though, it's key to make sure you ask yourself um, things, these questions in advance so that you know, you know why you're proceeding. And sometimes you have to pivot and reverse course or steer to the left because that's actually more prudent at the time. So it's okay to change your mind as well. You know, that's the one thing we have, we have free will. Um, but if you decide to go ahead and move forward, be brave, don't overthink it, jump in. That's the first thing. The second thing is practice taking risks often in small ways so that it becomes habitual for you and you become less fearful. I said less fearful, not fear less, because I don't think we ever stop being afraid of taking risks. It's a natural element for us as human beings. But if you do take risk and you fail, that's okay too, because failure is important for success. Nothing great ever happens without being um, a person who is challenged or a person who errs. But the key is to fail forward. Move forward in failure. Make sure that you're failing in a way that's gonna give you information so that you can do it better next time. I always call failing forward is not the same as failing because all failure is not equal. Let's talk a little bit about blazing trails as we talk about failure, because I think most trailblazers actually have failed and failed in big ways at that. Um, one of the things that I think is important to understand about trailblazers is that they're not people who typically blend into the crowd. These are people who stand not just out, but stand above the crowd. They are oftentimes pioneers and innovators. They're leaders, okay? They're thinking big, they're, they're moving um, individually and not just with the masses, they're not into group think, and they're comfortable with failing. And I think that's really important to know. So if you wanna blaze a trail and you wanna be a trailblazer, then you've gotta get comfortable with not getting it right. You have to be comfortable with understanding that, in fact, you're gonna make some big mistakes. But you know, Warren Buffett has said basically that he never hires anyone who hasn't failed big. And I think that's something that we all should probably take to heart. Um, the other thing is you can be a trailblazer in your everyday life. This doesn't require you going out and like crossing Antarctica like the gentleman who just did it, you know, doesn't require you swimming with white sharks or doing something daredevilish all the time. It could be something simple where you just sort of decide you're going to try something different. You're going to express something different. You're going to raise your hand in a meeting and volunteer for a task that you haven't volunteered for before. It might be something simple as helping someone that you haven't just, you know, haven't helped in the past or someone that um, you know, comes to you for assistance, you might be able to navigate and help them in their own career. Sometimes Blazing Trails doesn't just involve you, sometimes it involves you helping other people too. So I think it's really important to understand that we all have power to sort of not just take risks, not just to blaze trails, but to use our power in, in our small ways to create something big. And the most important thing I would say as, as we think about, you know, the whole idea of setting ourselves apart from other people um, is that not just risk taking and not just failure are important, but the ability to have courage and to dare greatly to move beyond the, the, the criticism of others, but to really focus on what the true task is at hand. You know, President Theodore Roosevelt has a famous quote about the man in the arena, and he basically says, you know, he says that it is not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points to the man of how strong the, how the strong man stumbles, excuse me, or where the doer of good deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds? Who knows great enthusiasms? Who knows the great devotions? And who spends himself in a worthy cause? And who at best in the end, the triumph of high achievement? And who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly? So that his place 
shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. And I think what's so powerful about that quote is that it's about getting in. Life is a player sport. Life is actually an engaging um, sport. It is not one who just sits back, who actually wins, even if we think we do because we're not marred or scarred. Brene Brown has a, a wonderful book where she basically takes this quote and talks, us, talks to us about vulnerability and the power to put ourselves out there to try something. And so if I can leave you with one thing, I would say risk-taking, trailblazing, and the ability to move forward in spite of fear are things that all require courage. And being courageous can just take small, you know, little sort of, um, they can be small steps in our lives. They don't have to be something magical or huge. I will tell you that every day I, I promise myself to do one thing that's scary. And so I challenge you to do the same thing. It might be walking a different path. It might be calling someone on the phone if you haven't talked to in a long time. Or it might be doing something huge. Whatever it might be for you, get out there and do it. Be the guy in the arena. Be the woman in the arena who dares greatly. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Um, now, everyone that's uh, participating would love if you could ask some questions. Feel free to enter in. Uh, any questions you have, you can also just raise your hand uh, through, the, through the webinar, uh, and I can call on you to ask it directly. So while we wait for questions to come up, um, I have a question myself. Um, so Khadija, it seems like you were a trailblazer from the earliest um, parts of your, of your life, being a political activist you know, in, before high school. And were you encouraged? Like, how did you? How did that come about? Did you think that was something just natural within you, or is that something that was encouraged and brought out to you by other important people in your life? Thanks, Catherine. So I think that I was um, I was influenced by a lot of the people that I learned about as a child. People like Shirley Chisholm and Barbara Jordan, who were both African American women politicians, um, who. I recognize had come from humble beginnings, much like my humble beginning, and at the same time um, had used their power in ways that was basically uh, not just inspiring, but prob prob I would say improbable in a lot of ways. And so Shirley Chisholm had run for president in 1972. Um, she was the first African American to run for president and, and, you know, and actually was um, not just powerful when she spoke and when she talked about the issues that were before her, but she was inspiring, I think. And so I learned that I had power too, even where I sat in eighth grade, when we had young people who were dropping out of school for a number of reasons, from teenage pregnancy to drug use and everything else, that I thought, you know what, I might not be a politician, I might not have a lot of power, and I didn't have a law degree at that point, but I certainly had the power to talk to young people about what they should be doing with their lives and what we should all be invested in in terms of our education. So that's really how it started. But I, I think I read a lot. I, I was exposed from, by my mom to a lot of visionaries and I, and I thought that I had the ability to change my own existence. Um, and so I just started to do small things. Another question from Tiffany Tolbert. Tiffany, would you like to ask it directly? I unmuted your line. Not, I'm, happy I'm not sure how to do it. Uh -oh. Am I muted? Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. I wanted to ask, I am all for risk taking. How do you bounce, bounce back from a risk that wasn't quite as successful as we expected it to be? So, okay, that's a great question, Tiffany. How do you bounce back from risk taking when it wasn't as successful? So I think the key to risk taking um, bounce when you bounce back from those things um, is resilience. It's called resilience. <laughs> I think we, people talk a lot about, us, about it today. Um, and it really, it really means that what happens is that we, first of all, take stock of what went well, what didn't go well, and then what we would do differently, right? Um, because if we take risk taking um, that doesn't go right as a failure and just a failure as itself, like a big F, then we're never going to do things like that again. And we don't want that to be the case. We want you to actually be able to say, you know what, I learned X, I learned Y, and now when I try it again or try it differently, I'll approach it this way. And I think if you can think of it that way, that you're never really at a loss, you're really always winning. If you're learning, you're winning, right? You may not get the result that you actually wanted, 
but perhaps you learn something more valuable. So I think having resilience and having grit is actually um, as important, if not even more important than winning. Perfect. Thank you for that. You're welcome. I have another question that came in. I think she doesn't have, let's see. Emily Lagrada, I unmuted if you'd like to ask it directly, otherwise I can ask on your behalf. Okay, I think it's not working, so I will ask. Um, I'm going to ask, in many of your experiences you've shared, your trailblazing and risk-taking yielded results because you had champions up the ladder willing to take those risks with you. Can you talk about managing up and identifying what arguments help the risk averse to jump in with you? Yes, certainly. Um, well, I think, yes, I think, I, well, I'll just be honest. I've had many people who have helped me along the way um, and not throw me to the wayside when I messed up, so let's just put it that way, or when I took risks that they thought were not worth taking. Um, how do you manage up and how do you deal with risk averse people? I think you have to do small things. If you are naturally a person who does not like to take risks, I'm not telling you to go out and do something super crazy. I don't think that's going to be helpful. That's just going to see if it wits out of you. So what you have to do is you have to start thinking about what you're, you almost have to reverse um, engineer your career or reverse engineer your life, right? So you think to the end game. What is the end in mind that you have? What are you hoping to achieve? So do small things, right, to get you to that place. You know, I would, sometimes you have like a stair step. So don't go to level 10 now, go to level one. Um, do small things. So let's just say, for instance, you're interested in, I'm gonna throw out there, um, you know, leading a department one day, and you wanna figure out how do you get more insight into this particular area of the business. So do small things. Ask people to launch, right, small steps. Send an email, just say, hey, you know, I'd love to come and talk to you informationally about this area of the business. I like to, do you have time for coffee or for lunch one day? Um, and then those things actually, I think, build up, but let it be organic and natural. If you're really averse and you're shy, or you don't really like to have any idea about how to, how to navigate this, then find people who that you can see in your organization or in your life who actually are good at this, and then they can possibly help you. Because, you know, I'm not gonna tell you that you ever stop being fearful about taking risks, because I'm afraid of things all the time, but I don't let that stop me. I think that if we let fear stop us, we'll never have the opportunity to see the greatness that we can all accomplish. And so I just wanna make sure that you don't misunderstand that I'm, like, I'm unafraid, I am afraid of things, things scare me, but I like it. I, I walk into fear with a hopefulness that perhaps I will come out braver. And so I would just say, find small ways to make meaningful change, small ways to climb the ladder, small ways to walk up into um, to risk taking and trailblazing in a way that's comfortable for you. And the key thing I would also say is when you do take a risk and there's a good or bad outcome, don't beat yourself up. Don't, don't pat yourself on the back too well either. Make sure you learn from it. Take stock of what happened, take stock of why it happened, and then use that as um, information that is valuable to help you propel further in the future. Are there any other questions from the participants? I'll give another minute. Well, I'd like to ask another while we have, um, oh, actually someone just came in, so I'll wait on mine. Uh, Rokea, I just allowed you to talk if you'd like to answer your question, uh, ask your question live. Okay, what networking organizations would you recommend for women in media? For that question, I would recommend, um, if you're in media, I'm not sure what area of the media you're in, but um, there are a lot of organizations such as WIT, Women in Cable Telecommunications, is a really, really um, fascinating and popular, more importantly, um, uh, impactful organization. Um, I actually have been a part of WIT for a long time, and they actually have women across various industries within the media um, who are both uh, mentoring devel and developing um, younger people who are just new to the business, but also a lot of people who are networking across the business. So I think that's one of them. 
There's also, um, you know, Gina Davis's institute, depending on what part of the media again you're in and what you're looking to get involved with, she has an institute that does a lot of research as well. So sometimes, you know, people might not be interested necessarily in film and TV per se, um, but, or maybe you'll say maybe so, you know, more so on the research side, she might be, her institute might be something that you're more interested in. There's also women in film. Um, for, the, for those of you who are in music or who are involved in some of those other um, areas, there are a number of, um, I would say, employee resource groups for people at labels and who are, even now, these days, actually, um, you see them, you know, at the Netflixes and all these other companies, quite frankly, um, across the tech industry, there are a lot of people who are developing their own um, organizations and employee resource groups. So I would say you have um, a vast majority of, of organizations, and if you want to reach out to me, um, I, I can probably give you some more in case those are not ones that are right up your alley or are not um, more closely aligned with the is issues that you are focused on. Uh, so it seems like you've been doing a number, uh, some mentoring of uh, individuals within um, your organization. How would you recommend for the people on the call, um, you know, to find internal support as they're trying to be a trailblazer and maybe take some risks, to make sure they have some advocates internally? Like what advice would you give to them? Just find that um, organic relationships are best in terms of mentoring. And sometimes, you know, people will come to me and say, I've been trying to find a mentor for so long, I just can't find one. Or, you know, I'm hoping this person will be my mentor, but they don't have the time. What I would say to people who are interested in, in get, finding a mentor, more importantly, a sponsor, I would say, because, you know, there's a whole other level of social engagement and, and capital investing, um, you know, um, to get sponsorships. I think that's really key. But, you know, sometimes people have natural interests that they just connect on. So it might be that somebody plays, I don't know, um, badminton or something like that, right? They just like talk about that, you know, over lunch one day. Or um, you might see someone who has done something that you're, you're intrigued by. Maybe they wrote an article and you want to ask them more about that article. I would say feel free to, you know, reach out, extend yourself a little bit, raise your hand, ask if you could help someone on a special project. It might be that you might want to know more about a particular area of, of the business and you want to sort of figure out how do I get involved in this? Um, you don't always have to get paid for doing extra work. I, that's what I did. I actually would raise my hand for stuff. I did M&A work. I did theater production work. I wasn't even skilled in those areas, but I was like, but I want to learn about it, you know? So I think if, you, if you're always eager to learn, people love that. And if you have intellectual curiosity in a whole other way, then you can get people to come and sort of be your advocates. I actually focused on getting sponsors in places where, you know, it wasn't just the business that I was doing in terms of business affairs, it was actually, there were people who were in other areas of the business. There was a marketing person who sponsored me on one area. And it was a person who did, um, who was, was actually um, a, a, a global inclusion person in another area. There was a person who was in finance in another area who helped me. So some of my biggest supporters were not lawyers, quite frankly. Some of them were, but some of them were not. I think we just have to be open to the fact that because you do a particular job doesn't mean that defines who you are in total. And um, sometimes sponsors are people who are not even in the same area of the business that you will be in. But if they can speak your name in a room where you're not present and they can herald you and say, give it to her, give, give him the assignment, help them out, you know, give them a chance, then those are sponsors for you. Um, and they don't always have to call themselves that, but that's in fact what they are. I don't see any other questions for the moment. Um, so Khadija, Thank you so much. This has been very exciting. I don't know if you have any other closing remarks, but uh, it's been really uh, my pleasure to be here today. I hope everyone enjoyed the, the talk. Thank you, Catherine. I had such a great time, and I hope that you all did too. And, you know, again, if nothing else, I leave you with the word, two words, dare greatly and move forward. And I wish you um, a lot of risk-taking and trailblazing and loads of success in 2019. Thank you.